parking cost roads. There we go, there we go. For those who don't know me or those online, my name is Alex and I'm the lead pastor here. And at Crossroads, we're moving to connect ourselves and others to God. And we want to make an impact in your life, in the community, and in the world for God. And it is our desire that you know that you have value, worth, and purpose in God. And it is our hope that together we discover who God is and the love that he has for each of us. And we do that by connecting to God, connecting to others, and connecting others to God. I share that every week because I want you to internalize it in your heart. And uh, today, as I share the message, I just invite you to move as the Spirit moves with you. If you want to read the Scripture with me, read the Scripture. If you want to pray or clap or cheer, you can do that as well. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Philippians 1. If you have your bulletins, you can follow along. We also have a blog that we post all each week about it and a, bull, uh, a bookmark in the back that will help you go a little bit deeper in this conversation. Um, we are in this new series called Citizens of Joy. And I am so excited because I love things that are joyful. Um, and we're going to be talking about joy in all circumstances and situations. I am on uh, the Enneagram. I'm an Enneagram 7, which means I love good and joyful things. I love excitement. I love jumping up and down. I love celebrating all the time. Um, and so I'm excited about this series. Our first, uh, the first message in the series is called Joy in Suffering. In the midst of suffering, Christ brings profound peace and hope and joy. So I have a question for you. Have you ever had a significant challenge or obstacle? Well, of course we have, you would say. Yes, I've had those in my life. But here's the real question. How did it impact your faith or your perspective on life? Did you find it difficult or nearly impossible during that hardship or challenge to discover joy? Were you clinging to the hope that it would pass? Were you praying that God would take away whatever challenge or hardship you were going through? Did it take every ounce of strength to get up in the morning? Did it feel like your soul was sucked out from you? Welcome to the first week of Citizens of Joy. I know, that's an intense one right there. We're going to dive into Philippians 1, and where the Apostle Paul teaches us about finding joy amidst suffering. What? This has got to be a mistake, Alex. How do you find joy amidst suffering? Well, I'm going to give you a little warning. This is not going to be necessarily an easy subject. It's going to give you a little bit of holy unrest. It might challenge you to be a little bit uncomfortable, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, this will be probably counterintuitive to the way the world talks about it because joy in the world is often equated with comfort and success. But in today's scripture, we'll see from Paul, he'll reveal a profound truth uh, that true joy is found in Christ, transcending our circumstances. Paul wrote this letter to the church of Philippia while in prison and facing uncertainty and harsh conditions. Yet his words are filled with joy. How can this be? This does not make sense. How can someone find joy amid suffering? Clearly, Paul must have been off his rocker a bit. Or perhaps Paul discovered joy that transcended this world. Perhaps Paul wasn't looking for joy amongst the physical and tangible things. But perhaps we'll see that through Paul's example and teachings, we'll uncover how our hardships can serve a greater purpose and where we can find joy despite the circumstances or situations. Now, I want to share with you a story I stumbled on uh, this last week. Um, and it's talking about these missionaries in the 1930s, John and Betty Stan, who were missionaries to China. They were newly married couples, but they felt uh, called to go to China to share the gospel. Uh, they knew that there was a potential of imprisonment, torture, and even death, and yet they found, felt this profound calling inside of them to the Chinese people. They, their faith and dedication led them to the city of Tsing. I'm going to say that wrong, and I know that, um, where they worked to share the message of Christ. In 1934, their mission took a horrible turn 
when communist soldiers invaded to sing and captured John and Betty along with their infant daughter. The couple were imprisoned in harsh conditions, knowing that their lives were in grave danger. Yet despite the imminent threat, they remained steadfast in their faith. And John wrote a letter to the China Inland Mission stating, The Lord bless and guide you. And as for us, may God be glorified whether by life or by death. A quick side note, when John, Betty, and Helen were taken to local prison, some of the prisoners were actually released to make room for the stands. The story might sound a little bit familiar to some of us in the scriptures because Jesus was imprisoned even though he was innocent. He was put in there because of his faith. And at the same time, Barbaeus, who was a murderer, was released to make room for Jesus. What amazes me about the stands is how the stands showed courage and unwavering faith despite their circumstance. But unfortunately, on December 8th, 1934, John and Betty were executed, but their infant daughter was miraculously spared. Actually, her daughter was found two days afterwards and was hidden in a small house by local believers until she was rescued. And then the story of martyrdom spread quickly, reaching Christians worldwide, inspiring many to commit their life to Christ and to find joy in the midst of suffering. What surprises me about this story of John and Betty is their willingness to embrace suffering for the sake of the gospel. They didn't know how their story would play out or how God would use it, but they maintained their commitment to Christ. They discovered that joy is not tied to their circumstances, but is found in their relationship with Christ. That even in the darkest moments, our faith can shine the brightest and Our hardships can serve to advance the kingdom in powerful ways. What I hope you discover today is, in the midst of suffering, Christ brings profound peace, hope, and joy. What we'll focus on today is joy in the gospel's progress to live in Christ, conduct worthy of the gospel. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, glorious and gracious God, you are incredible. You are amazing and help us to find joy in the midst of everything that we're going through. Help us to find joy in the midst of suffering. Help us to find joy in the midst of the ups and downs of life. Father God, we don't know how, how our life is going to play out. But Father God, may we find your joy in the midst of it all. In your son's precious and holy name. Amen? Amen. Did you know that uh, when Paul wrote this letter, it was during an imprisonment, and he was actually chained to Roman guards. Can you imagine what that was like, to have someone near you 24-7, watching every move, every gesture, every speech you say, knowing that there is no chance of freedom, no chance of privacy, no chance of dignity or respect? The crazy thing is, we don't even have that kind of security today. I mean, we lock away criminals and terrorists, and and we put them away in tight security jails. But do we chain a guard to them 24-7? No. And what I find even more profound about Paul's time in the prison is that as these guards rotate daily, to being chained to Paul. Paul ensured that every single one of them heard the gospel. Because of Paul's faith, many came to know Christ, which is absolutely crazy. In the midst of his suffering, he shared about the joy and the hope of Jesus. Paul's suffering served as a catalyst to spreading the gospel in ways that would have been impossible without his imprisonment. Surely God was doing something incredible through Paul's hardship. Okay, I have another story for you. This one's about Cory ten Boom, a Dutch Christian watchmaker who, along with her family, uh, harbored hundreds of Jews amidst the Nazi Holocaust to protect them during World War II. It's believed that they saved nearly 800 individuals. Eventually, they were betrayed and their whole family was imprisoned in a concentration camp. But despite the conditions 
She and her sister remained full of joy and hope. They conducted Bible studies and shared the gospel with fellow prisoners. Many found faith in Christ through their ministry. Many found hope through the story of Jesus. Corey Leo said that God's light shines brightest in the darkest places. God's light shines brightest in the darkest places. Amen. Have you ever asked yourself how God might be using you to shine light in the darkest of places? How God might be using you to shine light in the darkest of places? If you have your Bibles, you can open with me to Philippians 1, 12 through 14. And we're going to see what Paul says about shining light in the darkest of places. From Philippians 1, 12 through 14, Philippians 1, 12 through 14, and you can also read it on the screen here. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Here's what I love about this text. Paul's heart is set on God, not on the world around him. The world may try to bind him, but it can't touch Paul's spirit. He's unafraid of the consequences that might come because of his testimony in Christ. Whether he faces imprisonment, persecution, punishment, beatings, or mockery, none of these things matter to Paul. His sole focus is on the gospel. Though his body may suffer, his soul is free. And any punishment, even death he faces, is nothing compared to the heavenly award, reward that awaits him. We should take note that Paul highlights his own persecution and own imprisonment in Rome. Rather than hindering the gospel, these trials have actually advanced the gospel of love and joy. He reassures the Philippians that even though he is physically restricted, human limitations cannot stop the spread of the gospel. Now you may be thinking, did Paul commit a crime? No. Did he do something wrong? Nope. Then why was he imprisoned? Why was he bound to guards by chains? The scriptures say he was in chains for Christ. The entire palace guard, along with the common people in the streets, understood that he was in prison due to his unwavering commitment to Christ. What's also incredible about this text is just because Paul was unable to minister freely doesn't mean the gospel stopped at the palace gates. Paul says that other believers stepped up to the plate, taking the baton to speak God's word in Paul's absence. Can you imagine Seeing someone like your friend or family member in prison because of their faith. And then you wanting to do likewise. Like choosing willingly to do the same thing, knowing that your fate might be the same as theirs. It is a powerful testimony to the gospel. Paul was fully committed to sharing the gospel, and so were his friends. It didn't matter the circumstance or the situation Paul knew the power of the gospel. He knew that he had received such a gift of love and joy and hope and peace through Jesus. That it didn't matter what circumstance or situation he was in, he wanted to share that with others. And the gospel continued to be spread, inspired by Paul's steadfast example, praise God. Oh, I love how the gospel compels people to share the good news, despite the conditions, situations, or human limitations. Amen. And I think verse 18 through 20 sums this idea up so well. Read with me Philippians 1, 18 through 20. Philippians 1, 18 through 20. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, What has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, 
but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Oh, what a powerful text. Joy in the gospel's progress is knowing that our hardship can serve to advance the message of Christ. Knowing that our hardships can serve. This means that when we place our trust and faith in Jesus, we can find joy amidst any situation or circumstance. But when I place my faith and trust in the world, it seems to disappoint me time and time again. I go, well, this didn't turn out the way I wanted, and this didn't go the way I wanted. And so I feel bound. I feel depressed. I feel overwhelmed. But when I place it in Christ, I find a joy in spite of my circumstance, in spite of my situation or human limitation. It goes beyond anything I am experiencing. My joy isn't determined by what's going on around me. My joy is, going, is determined because I know who I am in Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to restate this last part of the verse, verse 20, and reread, uh, and then read with you verse 21. Some might argue this is the most important part of the text. If you will read this with me, I think this is so important. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul viewed life and death as opportunities to bring glory to God, whether through living and continuing his ministry or dying and being with Christ. He remained focused on exalting Jesus. Now, let me be clear about this text. He is not talking about suicide. He's not trying to commit a crime or get himself killed, but this is by persecution of faith which may result in death. As noted before, many people view this scripture as the heart of the text. It beautifully shows that Christ is the center of Paul's life. Paul boldly declared to live as Christ. For him, living means serving and glorifying Christ. And even in death, he sees it as a blessing, being with Christ in heaven, free from the trials of the world. So for Paul, to die is to gain. In either case, Paul will remain in Christ. He knows who he is. He is a child of the beloved, and he knows his purpose is to bring glory to God. What would it look like for us to live as Christ and to die is to gain? Now, this might push some buttons a little bit. What would we have to give up? What would we have to let go to make this true? Do you groan and complain every time something bad happens? Do you gossip about the people who have wronged you? Are you doing things that are encounter to God? Are you so focused on this world that you can't see the blessings before you? Do you focus more on what's happening to you than what God is doing through you? Or what I used to say to my students in youth ministry, are you spearing vomit instead of pouring out blessings? One of my favorite missionaries or pastors is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor and theologian who is remembered for his courageous stand against the Nazi regime during World War II. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born into a prominent family, and he was highly educated and deeply committed to Christ. His theological insights and writings have had lasting impact on Christian thought and particularly his emphasis on the cost of discipleship and the need to stand against injustice. Bonhoeffer's opposition to Hitler and the Nazi ideology was not just theological. It was practical and costly. He joined the Confessing Church, a movement that opposed the Nazis' attempt to control the German churches. Bonhoeffer was a constant critic of the regime. Like Paul, his faith and involvement in the resistance movement led to his arrest. And like Paul, while in prison, Bonhoeffer continued his ministry under dire circumstances. This is a man of God. 
And despite the grim circumstances, he remained a beacon of hope and faith and joy. He conducted secret worship services, offered pastoral care to fellow prisoners, did Bible studies, and wrote extensively. He shared the joy of Christ wherever he was. And like Paul, his letters from prison were later compiled into a book revealing his deep faith and commitment to Christ. Praise God. But there is one particular moment that stood out to me about Bonhoeffer. On April 8, 1945, just two weeks before his execution, Bonhoeffer led a service for fellow prisoners. And a fellow inmate described how Bonhoeffer was calm and composed, and he shared the message of Christ's resurrection, of hope and joy it brings. He ended his service with prayer, imparting peace to those around him, despite the impending death that was coming the next day. Bonhoeffer was a man of God. And like Paul, Bonhoeffer knew that to live for Christ was to die to himself, was to let go of what the world thought was important. He could find joy in suffering because it was not bound to this world. Instead, he found joy and purpose in serving Christ. So whether he was experiencing a wonderful occasion, a mountaintop experience, or he was in the depths of darkness, Bonhoeffer and Paul found themselves bound to the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and could discover joy because of it. For a worldly person, death means losing all earthly comforts and hopes. For a true believer, death through persecution of their faith is a gain, freeing themselves from life's evil and bringing them into the presence of God's goodness. For the Apostle Paul, the real dilemma wasn't between living in this world and living in heaven. There's no comparison there. It's not about choosing between two bad things, but rather two incredible, living for Christ and being with him. To live is Christ finding purpose and joy in serving him. Finding purpose and joy in serving him. It's in your notes. And this is all about Paul placing his identity in Christ, knowing that, man, the circumstances around him can change. At a flick of a moment, your life could radically change. You could be on the mountaintop and then fall to the depths of darkness. And Paul knows that. He experienced that himself. He was constantly persecuted. At times, he was sharing the gospel with others, and other times, he was in jail. At times, he was around fellow brothers and sisters for Christ, and other times, he was being mocked and demeaned and demoralized. But his joy wasn't placed in this world. His joy was found in Christ. And that joy never changes. And I want to be clear that Paul, again, was not talking about suicide when he's talking about death. He advocates for life and the preservation of life. He was talking about being put to death because of his faith. He didn't try to commit a crime or get himself killed. He simply lived out his faith in Christ. And if his life was spared, he rejoiced. And if it was to come to an end, he was at peace. Now, one of the things I deeply appreciate about Paul is the ability to be deeply honest and authentic. He didn't hold punches. If he thought you were out of alignment, he would let you know. It's like that two-by-four friend, right, that just knocks you over the side of the head whether you want to hear the advice or not. If he felt called to share the gospel with you, he would. And it is this very characteristic that landed him in jail, his boldness and singular focus uh, mind did not, uh, did not allow the world to sway him. But he's also not ignorant of the temptations of this world. He understands how difficult this world can be, that there are going to be pressures from this world on you and I. The evil one is going to do everything at its disposal to get us to renounce our faith in Christ, to get us to feel depressed, alone, separated, isolated, to feel the depths of the darkness. The evil one does not want us to feel joy. The task before us is not an easy one. And Paul knows that followers of Christ will endure great suffering just as he endured great suffering. Anyone who follows Christ 
will be may be rejected by this world just as Jesus was rejected and put on the cross. So at the end of Philippians 1, Paul says this about following Christ. Philippians 1, 27 through 28. Philippians 1, 27 through 28. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. The early Christians in Rome faced great persecution and hardship for their faith. Paul was just one of many believers who suffered death because of his faith. Under the rule of the emperors like Nero, Christians were often scapegoats for political problems and subjected to br brutal punishments. And what's incredible to me is despite everything going around, despite the mockery, the punishments, they remained faithful and they had unwavering faith in the gospel. And it serves as this powerful testimony to us. One of the most harrowing periods was during reign, Nero's reign. When a great fire broke out in Rome in 64 AD, Nero blamed the Christians for the fire, and which led to widespread and severe persecution. Many Christians were tortured, arrested, and executed in gruesome ways. Some were crucified, some were thrown into pits with wild animals, and some were even set ablaze to illuminate the nights for Nero. And despite the horrific conditions, these early Christians remained steadfast in their faith and joy. I am amazed at what they endured and how they still had faith and joy amidst everything going on. They continued to gather secretly for worship, often in the catacombs or grave sites, where they sang hymns, prayed, rejoiced together, and shared in the Lord's Supper. Now, we may think we have it bad by being in an air-conditioned room when it's 105 outside, but they had to worship among the dead. Their unity and love for one another was evident that even in the darkest times, they provided for the needs of the community. They cared for the sick and the poor and the lost. They loved on those who had lost loved ones. Paul was acutely aware of the dire situations that followers of Christ would face. It's why Paul, in his final days, in Rome in prison, awaiting execution, wrote these letters so that we might have joy despite our circumstances. Despite being in chains, Paul wanted us to encourage fellow believers to remain strong in their faith and be joyful, to live lives worthy of the gospel. It's astonishing to think that individuals of such suffering and persecution would have such joy. Paul's letters, many of them were written from prison, continue to inspire and instruct us today. The early Christians conducted their lives in amazing ways, despite the adversity, the pain, the suffering that they endured. Their lives were a testament to the gospel of Jesus Christ and their hope and faith and joy in the resurrection their courage and unity under persecution drew many to faith. Those of the world looked at them and said, what is it that gives you such joy amidst suffering? And they could point to their Lord Jesus Christ. Their conduct was worthy of the gospel, living lives that reflect God, Christ's love, integrity, and sacrifice, especially in the face of adversity. That is in your notes, living lives that reflect Christ's love, integrity, and sacrifice, especially in the face of adversity. Paul knew the suffering because he experienced himself. He was writing letters out of his own experience. And he was sharing with us that in the midst of suffering, can you still have joy? Can you still rejoice and celebrate 
Can you still praise God? Can you still help the needy, care for the poor, love those around you, love those who've lost loved ones? Those who chose to follow Christ and make him the Lord and Savior gave up everything, and they found great joy in it. I don't know if you know this about me, but I love joy. I love celebrating things. I love excitement. I, some people say I have rose-colored glasses uh, because I love seeing the goodness of every situation. And I get so excited about life and about Jesus. And I love to jump up and down. And it's like a big party to me, celebrating the goodness of God. But joy and suffering, this is an interesting concept to me. And in the first chapter, this is what Paul is describing in Philippians. Paul introduces this profound concept of joy amidst suffering. Imprisoned and facing uncertain outcomes, Paul remains committed to the mission, and he discovers joy amidst it. This doesn't follow the worldly narrative, does it? It doesn't follow that narrative of comfort and success bring joy. Paul said, in all circumstances, find joy. And I know this is incredibly hard. Paul's not playing games. He doesn't think that this is easy. But he's encouraging the church of Philippia and us to view our own hardships through the lens of purpose and divine orchestration. Paul has flipped the script once again. Paul's joy is not contingent upon the circumstances, but is deeply rooted in Christ and the progress of the gospel. I wonder how the world would be different if we found joy in Christ instead of the things of this world. If we found joy in Christ instead of things of this world. Paul's example challenges us to reframe our understanding of suffering. Rather than to see it as a hindrance, he views it as an opportunity for the gospel to flourish and for the faith to be strengthened. He reassures the Philippians that even in chains, his ministry thrives, inspiring others to speak boldly for Christ, to discover this great source of love and compassion and hope and peace and joy. I admire Paul's unwavering faith and joy and suffering as they serve as a powerful testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which encourages believers to find joy in their trials by focusing on Christ and his eternal promises. Amen. So what does God say about joy and suffering? Joy in the gospel's progress is knowing that our hardships can serve to advance the message of Christ, is knowing that our hardships can serve to advance the message of Christ. And in other words, like, we can choose the perspective that we take. And people are going to look at us and they're like, man, why are you filled with so darkness? Or why are you filled with so much joy in spite of your circumstances? It's really hard and challenging. Paul makes, (laughs) Paul does not pretend this is easy. But it becomes a testimony to the world to say, Even in the midst of darkness, I can find joy because I know whose I am. To live in Christ is finding purpose and joy in serving him. It's finding purpose and joy in serving him. It's not about what I want to do. It's about pursuing what God has for me and for this world. Yeah, I I don't want to deal with conflict and difficult situations. I'd rather not have to deal with hardships and challenges, I'll be honest. But to live in Christ is finding purpose and joy and serving him that no matter the circumstance or the situation, that I'm going to follow him in conduct worthy of the gospel, living lives that reflects Christ's love, integrity, and sacrifice, especially in the face of adversity. Living lives that reflect Christ's love, integrity, and sacrifice, especially in the face of adversity. This is extremely challenging, like I said at the beginning. Because it means we have to live differently than the world's narrative. And this is what God calls us into. And so I'm going to pray for us.
And then at the end of the prayer, if you want to accept Jesus into your life, or if you've already accepted Jesus into your life, you can say this uh, confessional prayer with me and repeat after me. And this is just going, God, I want to follow your way, your path, your, your, I want to find joy in the midst of everything. This is us saying, God, I, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I can't do this alone. I'm broken. I'm lonely. I'm isolated. I need you in my life to give me hope, peace, and joy. Let me pray for us. Father God, you are good and holy. And God, I just rejoice at being in your presence. Father God, you are amazing. And God, every day, in your presence is a good day. God, may we honor you and praise you and give you thanks. God, may we never stop living for you. May we reach out to those who are lonely or broken or hurting or in pain or suffering or going through difficult hardships, medical conditions, financial situation. God, may we reach out to them and share with them the love and peace and hope and joy of Christ so that they too may receive this great gift so that they too may know that they are beloved children of God. God, we pray this in your son's precious holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now help me to live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. If